Dr. Jackie Davis, she's co-chair of the NHS Consultants Association and a member of the BMA Council. Thank you, Jackie. a sharp lesson this morning, which is never try and follow Francis Edgrave on the platform. That was a great speech, thank you. Um, some of it, I'm afraid, is going to be repeated here, but you can never hear these things often enough. Um, I'm honoured to have been invited to open this very important meeting, along with Francis, and I should really say how pleased I am to be here amongst friends. I know so many faces in the audience, don't remember everybody's name, of course, but, you know, uh, it's great to see you all here today. I'm not happy to be here. We're only here today because despite our heroic efforts, we couldn't halt that monstrous health and social care bill. And we're only here today because we are faced with the destruction of our English National Health Service. But we're also here today, as Francis has said, because it is inconceivable that we will not fight this act of vandalism against our health service. And we're here to launch that fight today to reclaim our NHS. So let's just look back for a moment. That legislation was bulldozed through Parliament with the assistance of the Liberal Democrats, a scandalous betrayal which will not be forgotten or forgiven. In its final stages, it was encumbered with over a thousand amendments and is now even more Byzantine and pointless than it was when it first saw the light of day. It was opposed by every major organization representing healthcare workers, and it degenerated from a bill which Lansley told us was going to empower doctors and patients into a battle with vested professional interests. Its passage became a matter of political pride and personal prestige, an arm wrestling match in which the coalition leadership had invested too much to back down its passage was, quite frankly, a low point for democracy in this country. Yeah. Let's just remind ourselves why it matters so much. This legislation is a bottle of snake oil. It doesn't do anything, it says on the label. Cut costs? No, costs are going to rise. It's going to cost us £10 billion a year to run a market in healthcare in this country, which nobody wants and which could be spent on frontline care. Cuts bureaucracy? We've already heard third la three layers of bureaucracy going to seven. Power to patients? I don't think so. Tesco or Tesco, anybody? Virgin or Virgin, if you came here by train today? Power to doctors and frontline staff? GPs are already answering to commissioning support services run by private companies. In London, GPs have been forced to pay for support from companies like this. McKinsey's and the like will be making millions, already have made millions, and at the same time, those GPs are already taking the blame for the massive cuts in budget. We're already seeing the headlines, GPs deny care to patients. This bill will adversely affect one of the core functions of the National Health Service, that is teaching and training the next generation of healthcare workers. No wonder the government defied the law and refused to release the risk register so that we knew what was going on. It's already happening as we predicted. It's fragmenting the service, complicating the patient pathway, handing power to private companies. NHS care will end up being delivered by a rag bag of competing companies with the NHS as a logo if we don't stop it. And patients won't even know who is giving them their care because it's all going to be part of that cosy NHS family. So we've heard from politicians, does it matter if the private sector provides the service as long as it's free at the point of delivery? How often have we heard that? But we know costs go up, standards go down, and there's less equity in the service. If you want to know what the private sector get up to, just think about breast implants. You know, when it all goes wrong, either the company who's responsible have packed up and gone somewhere else, or they don't want to know anything about it. And what do they do every time? They dump it back on the National Health Service. So that's what we're looking at if we can't fight this. The Care Quality Commission cannot even monitor the system as it is at the moment, let alone when we've got all these new private people coming in to sort it out. As for hospitals, I work in a hospital. They were hardly considered in that bill. And they're going to lose income, and that's going to have a very serious effect on patients. 
they're going to lose income because GPs with reduced budgets are going to try and keep care in the community, some of that appropriately and perhaps some of that not appropriately. Those private companies are going to come along and cherry pick the cheap and easy work that our hospitals do in order to cross subsidize the complicated stuff that the private sector doesn't do and won't do because it can't make a profit doing it. And in order to remain solvent and not to end up like Hinchingbrook Hospital, foundation trusts um, have to make money. They have to stay in profit. So what are they going to do? They're going to start looking at that 49% cap on private patients and bringing private patients in to make up their budget. And I've heard people say, well, they'll build extra beds to do that. No, they won't. Those private patients are going to be in NHS beds and the NHS, beds are going to, and the NHS patients are going to be back at the queue. At back of the queue. The tragedy about this bill is that it wasn't necessary. We didn't need this bill because the NHS is, or was until they started messing around with it, an extremely good public service. The Commonwealth study and other studies show that the NHS is very cost effective, equitable, with increasingly good outcomes, and popular with the public. But the coalition had to attack the NHS to justify their radical changes. They, rep they repeatedly lied and cherry-picked statistics to justify these reforms. They lied about heart attack survival rates. They lied shamelessly about cancer outcomes in order to frighten us. A paper in the BMJ showed that these statistics were abused. A paper in the Lancet showed productivity had gone up, not down, as claimed by politicians. New research shows that our outcomes are improving rapidly and will soon overtake many of the countries with whom Landley and Cameron, Cameron uh, compared us unfavorably. But the Daily Mail is not interested in academic papers, and the public don't hear those things, and the damage was done. And as Francis said, confidence in the NHS has fallen sharply amongst the public. Interestingly, it hasn't fallen sharply amongst patients, because patients still experience the NHS, and they know that despite what's going on at the moment, the staff are working really hard to make it the best possible experience. So what was the problem to which this act is the solution? This was a purely ideological attack on the NHS. The Tories have shamelessly exploited the financial crisis to launch the attack on the wider welfare state. And quite frankly, a successful public service is simply an anathema to these free marketeers. We fought very hard against it, and it's worth looking briefly at how it got through against our opposition, because we still face many of those problems. I'm afraid the mathematics of coalition politi politics were against us because the Lib Dems were never going to jump ship over this. Um, the bill was complicated. It was the size of a London telephone directory and about as interesting to read. You know, whoever sat down and read the whole damn thing. Um, we had an abysmal failure of medical leadership, both from my trades union and from the medical colleges. Andrew Lansley was still saying that doctors supported him on the day the bill went through, and it was disgraceful that he was allowed to say that. <laughs> Sir David Nicholson, Chief Executive of the National Health Service, told a conference last week that he was incredulous when he heard that Mr. Lansley had these plans for the NHS was angry and depressed about having to work with the coalition to implement the reforms. Well, here's an idea, Sir David. He could have resigned. <laughs> you could have told us why those reforms were so dreadful. That would have finished them off. But you didn't. And I hope that £250,000 a year was compensation for all the mental pain and anguish you suffered as a result of pushing them through. There was a shocking lack of investigative journalism over these reforms. The press coverage was lazy. The bill was complicated and confused and dangerous, but reporters constantly referred to it as giving money to GPs and giving power to patients, just regurgitating the government's propaganda. That was still the new strapline on the day the bill went through. On news and current affairs programs, there was a conspicuous absence of informed opponents debating the bill. The closest I heard to an opponent was, guess who? Baroness Shirley Williams, who was actually instrumental in getting it through. 
The lies told by the coalition to justify the reforms were repeated undigested, and we heard little about many of the things that Francis has mentioned. Landley's office, bankrolled by the chairman of Care UK, 96% of whose business comes through the NHS, never mentioned, nor significant Tory party funding by the private health sector. We heard little or nothing about the fact that 142 peers have financial connections with private health care, including one in four Tory peers. What would have happened if those people had not been allowed to vote on something in which they so clearly had a personal interest? We heard little about the infiltration of the public by the private sector with, for example, and I'm afraid I am going to talk about Virgin today, Virgin's commercial director sitting on the committee redesigning the NHS constitution. That's rather convenient, isn't it? So what's happened? Well, we're already seeing the effects of cuts and closures. Waiting times in A&E departments are up by 25% to eight-year high. Staff cut, wages cut, core services reduced, cataract and joint operations rationed. Hardly surprising that we heard last week that Benenden Healthcare, uh, a private healthcare insurance, has stepped up to publicly offer top-ups and co-payments to the public because of the rationing of core services. I don't blame them, they're business people. I blame Cameron for, for, getting, for, for allowing them, for us to be in a position where they can be doing that. As for the incursion of the private sector, they haven't been slow to uh, uh, appear at the door. Already Virgin has taken over a number of services. They recently signed a £650 million contract for community services in Surrey. And a freedom of information request to the PCT revealed, one, private uh, Virgin Care is not obliged to comply with the Freedom of Information Act and thus a cloak of secrecy will hang over its activities in Surrey and everywhere else. Two, NHS whistleblower protection legislation will not and does not apply to NHS staff transferred to the private sector. Three, Virgin Care Surrey, unlike NHS health boards, is not required to hold their meetings in public. Public accountability will be zero. Serco, the biggest company you've never heard of, specializes in outsourcing and their core function seems to be winning government contracts, regardless of what they're for. GPs and social enterprises stand little a chance against their deep pockets and their legal expertise. Serco is bidding alongside Virgin for children's services in Devon. These include important and sensitive areas like child protection and hospice care, but guess what? Neither of those companies have any experience in running children's services. And beware of crossing them. Virgin has already taken one PCT to court after it lost a contract, accusing them of charging too little for their services. So, in summary, what next? I, I don't want to go into a, a, a lot of detail about what we're going to do, because I hope that will come out today. But uh, we clearly are here to fight back. Um, first of all, we have to make it clear to coalition politicians, we do not forgive or forget their profoundly anti-democratic behavior. What we must remind ourselves is there are over a million people working in the National Health Service. Our votes, the votes of our friends and families, and our patients will be used to punish the politicians responsible for this. I spoke this week, it was terrific, at the Pensioners' Parliament up in Blackpool. There are a thousand pensioners there. Those pensioners can remember what life was like, many of them, before the health service. They appreciate that this health service gives us freedom from the fear of the financial consequences of illness, and they do not want to return to that. We must get those people on board with us to have this fight. And we must hold Labour to their promise to reverse the legislation, not tinker around the edges with it. Um, their messages at the moment are mixed. I do want to say one very important thing we're going to have to do, which is to work together to monitor the changes, because we're not going to hear about them from the government. You can bet. It's, it, by its very nature, it's going to be increasingly difficult to know what's going on, and service fragments and financial dealings and patient outcomes are lost, or already being lost, behind the curtain of commercial confidentiality. It's essential that we keep track of the real effects of the bill if we're to show that we were correct in our predictions of its dangers. Democracy, as I'm sure the classical scholars amongst you know, its root is ruled by the people. And when the voice of the people is distorted and ignored, we need to consider how to hold our representatives to account. 
This can be through the, through the ballot box, as I've said already, but extraordinary times demand extraordinary measures. And we haven't got much time. We haven't even got till the end of their session before they destroy the NHS. It's happening now. We're going to need a combination of actions. We need better media coverage. We need this evidence about the detrimental effects of the bill. We need organised protests, occupations, a refusal to cooperate with the legislation from the people who can do that. For example, a boycott of the private sector. We need to use social media to reach the public. And we need to support the new National Health Action Party. We will need stamina and an accurate dynamic picture of the reformed NHS, and quite frankly, in some cases, leaders to replace the complicit enablers who did too little too late. <laughs> David Cameron recently quoted Tony Blair. Sorry about those two names in one sentence. <laughs> Yeah, boo, come on. Uh, <laughs> David Cameron recently quoted Tony Blair's advice. Isn't that nice, Tony Blair's advising David Cameron now? On NHS reforms. That advice was to see the reform through because after the NHS bill passed, opposition would die away and it would be as if it was ever thus. Just think about that. So... I'm going to leave you, Mr. Cameron, and everybody here with the words of Mahatma Gandhi. When the government turns against the people, rebellion is a responsibility. We're not afraid to take on that responsibility. That's why we're here today. And the fight to reclaim our NHS is on. It begins here, and I know you will all be part of it. Thank you.